<clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, thanks for joining us for our book launch uh, of Growing Up Filipino, book three. The, uh, I'd like to welcome all of you. Again, I'd like to welcome Seal, have her back here. We had her last year, and uh, we're so happy to be able to host her book launch. Cecile is a very prolific uh, writer here amongst us in Southern California, and we're lucky to have her. Uh, she has written uh, three novels, The Newspaper Widow, Magdalena, and The Rainbow, When the Rainbow Widow, oh, When the Rainbow Goddess, oh, when the rainbow goddess Wept. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> in addition to those three novels, uh, she's... Uh, done these collections, anthologies of uh, stories. Uh, not only is she a writer, that was her preferred uh, career or uh, activity. She did her, her BA in uh, communication arts and then tried to do filmmaking at UCLA. But here we are, here we, are we have her as our, 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 hometown, girl, our, our hometown writer. So with that introduction, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Cecilia. Please uh, add more to what I've said and maybe keep us updated as to what you're doing today. And then from there, you could take it on and start the, uh, the, right. the book launch. Will this work for me? Yes, you have. Turn it over a bit. Yeah, so okay. just, just whoever's speaking, just put it in front okay. of you. This is really mainly for people who are joining online. You know, we can, all hear each other here, but we want well, people the, online to uh, hear us. So um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for being here. And I, I really want to acknowledge the Gayadas, um, Jocelyn, Jaime, for continuing this book club, starting it and continuing it and creating a, a, a literary community here in Los Angeles because that is really something that we need. And I I just really also want to acknowledge how the Gayagas are really famous for their community service and um, uh, their their political um, uh, engagement in, in our lives, you know. So thank you very much. It, it makes a difference at all. Yeah, and we were just remembering your mom <laughs> also was really a powerhouse in um, L.A. So, um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, I'll tell you what is planned today. Um, so, I thought I would tell you a little bit of how this new book came to be. And then I would, we would have, we have two authors here. Uh, one is the son of Miki Alfar, who is in the book, uh, Rio Alfar, and we have Marilyn Alfasola, who will also read from her story. And then afterwards, I thought what we would do is for fun, this is really more for fun, is if we have some people from the audience share their own uh, memories of growing up. And uh, there are some people have already singled out and warned that they will be called. And depending on the time that we can, we can see, we can add some more. And then we will have time for Q&A because you probably will have questions then about growing up with people. Um, so first of all, let me tell you what this book is about. This is a collection of 29, 25 short stories by Filipino writers in the United States, as well as in the Philippines, and I believe there are a couple from Singapore. And if I could have gotten them from wherever in the world, I would have, but that's what I got. And um, basically, it's talking about, it's fiction primarily, although some of them are heavily biographical. And they're, they're, the writers are drawing from their memories from their experiences or they make them up of growing up Filipino in whatever part of the world. Um, so that's primarily it. Um, 
There's some stories in here that I, you'll hear some samples, but there's some stories in here that I just want to point out. Um, first of all, let me read to you the, the contributors because I'm really very proud of them. And I also think that this is very much their book and they deserve to be acknowledged. So there, there, there is no particular order. It's as the stories fall. We have Gina Apostol, Kanika Claudine Peña, ja Jack Wigley, Veronica Montes, Nikki Alfar, Yvette Fernandez, Danton Remoto, George Dioso, Patricia Go, Migs Bravo Det, Ian Rosales Casoco. And by the way, Ian did our cover. Um, he did the cover study and um, he did a great job. I don't know if the Filipino version there. Yeah. But so the uh, this is the US edition, and uh, this is published here by Philippine American Literary House. But the University of Santo Tomas Publishing House did a Philippine edition, and so they, they have a, a different cover, but basically using the same uh, design. So <laughs> So we had Ian Casoco, uh, James Pajarito, Sarge La Cuesta, Dom C, Eileen Tabayos, Marianne Villanueva, and we have Marilyn here, Alto Sola, Brian Rowley, Patrick Joseph Kawili, Zach Linmark, Linda T. Casper, Rene Macalino Rutledge, Noel de Jesus, and Oscar Pineranda. So how this book came about this it's kind of a long story because this is now the third growing up Filipino there was a growing up Filipino stories for young adults and then at some point I did growing up Filipino to more stories for young adults but the very seed of where these anthologies came from goes way back when I was learning how to write, because I'm primarily a writer, and I was struggling with what we call writer's voice. And while living here in California, I was looking for books by Filipino American authors, and I could not find it. And this was way back, but I, I'm sorry to say it really has not, well, we may have changed, may have changed. But at the time, 1970s, you could not, Really, I think UCLA Library had Jose Rizal books, and I think there was one book by the yes, died. And that was sort of the sum and of their Philippine lit, so to speak. And I, um, so anyway, I couldn't find any books. I went ahead and became a writer. Uh, but in back of my mind, I always remembered that this book is not existent. And so at some point, when I already had a publisher, I suggested to her doing such an anthology, fiction by Filipinos in America. And uh, Doria Rodriguez at New Day was very supportive and said, sure, do it, Cecilia. So I did it, <laughs> I'm translating. It was not so simple then because we didn't have internet. So that meant tracking down the writers and writing them. So it was kind of a slow process, but I got it done. And it's really sort of a classic. It includes Carlos Blusan, our dear Carlos Blusan, and Ben Santos, and NPN Gonzalez, and some important Filipino writers, um, both here and up here, Filipinos in America. So at some point in time, I followed that up with contemporary fiction by Filipinos in America. There was a time lag, and uh, I had another publisher, and the publisher also said, go ahead. And so I did. And so this one um, was trying to include uh, not just the classic writers, but younger writers or newer emerging writers, I guess is the term. Um, but and actually, they have quite a lot of publications already. Some of these: John Silva, uh, Marco Atu, Vince Gotera, Oscar Peñaranda, uh, Jay Darry. So I mean, these are also quite talented uh, writers that we have in contemporary fiction by in America. And fast forward, meantime, I'm doing my three novels and I'm doing my other books, you know, and so on and so forth. 
And then I was talking to the marketing director of uh, my publisher at that time, Anvil, and she mentioned to me that there was a scarcity of young adult books. So this was in the Philippines. She says, Cecilia, why don't you do a book like that? And, um, and I said, yes. <laughs> I don't know why I say yes to things, but I do. <laughs> and then the young us who just drive me to things. So I did. And so that's where the first growing up Filipino came from, uh, from that suggestion and the realization that there was a lack of young adult books. So the growing up Filipino, the first one had like 29 short stories. It has been received actually quite, quite well, and it got reviews by book list and the publishers you know it was it was named it was received mainstream reviews and that was followed up at some point in time by growing up filipino 2 both growing up filipino 1 and 2 curiously even though a number of years had passed over the pandemic were included in the national geographic uh, recommended summer reading and I remember somebody just sent this to me and I could see it's summer reading National G. And then I went, huh, I mean, these books are old. This one, the first one came out in 2003 and the, the other one came out in 2011, I think. Or, so it's been, they're basically old books, but National G in 2020 would still recommend those books. So what that meant to me was that there is still a scarcity of good young adult uh, Filipino, Filipino American books. And in fact, since it was the pandemic and I had time to myself as we all did, I went ahead and I put together um, Growing Up Filipino 3, which we are now celebrating. Um, and so I think I'm just gonna go ahead and invite um, Rio to, to share his mom's piece. Later on, I was going to invite Rio to also share his own personal uh, uh, anecdote afterwards when we're, in the, we're in the sharing part. But let me read to you uh, Nikki Alfar's uh, bio. Nikki Alfar is a wife, mother, fictionist, dancer, kickboxer, knitter, and origami folder. Well, she has yet to receive a claim for folding, knitting, boxing, <laughs> dancing, mothering, or wifing. She has managed to catch repeated recognition out of the Palanca, Nick Joaquin, and International Mariner Literary Authorities, as well as back-to-back -back National Book Awards for her story collection, Wanderlust, and Now, Then, and Elsewhere. Nikki smokes like a chimney, maybe you can see nodding. Nikki smokes like a chimney and has one grand bunny and two children with writer Dean Francis Alfardi. These two are power, powerhouse writers in the Philippines. Rio is here. Rowan, I believe, is in the Philippines. And um, so here we have Rio sharing Nikki's uh, story or an excerpt of it. Okay, the story is called Donna Gin and the Crispa Rebonizers. During the basketball season when I was young, Donna Gin would ritually invoke divine intervention on behalf of the Crispa Rebonizers. <laughs> this was a lengthy process which required an assemblage of certain arcane paraphernalia. For a hand-high stack of well-thumbed Spanish novena pamphlets, the, fa the current favorite grocery out of her vast international collection, <laughs> and two identical used butter cookie tins, one of which was improbably always brimful with ivory colored watermelon seeds for mid game masturbation. The other was used as a receptacle for discarded seed shells. She was a masterful multitasker and could watch TV in rapt concentration without once stumbling in her muttered devotions or reaching by mistake into the wrong cookie tin. On those PBA game nights, she would ensconce herself, season all, on the living room sofa in front of the television while I read or did homework or otherwise occupied myself at her feet. I was in grade school then, which meant that my homework did not require the same soul-devouring intensity that my high school-aged brothers were obliged to focus on their own assignments under the watchful eyes of our suspicious parents. Instead, I was left with the ostensible care of Lola Gin, but even she could only divide her attention in so many ways among so many tasks. More often than not, I found myself with ample time and opportunity to take otherwise unconscionable liberties. 
such as eating powdered milk straight out of the tin can with a spoon and the untrammeled glee of having successfully achieved the forbidden. In our house, it was generally agreed that cookies came in tins, whereas all powdered substances from milk to tang came in cans. Don't ask me why. I was always careful to be very quiet when thus flagrantly flouting the laws of our land, though the reality was that I could probably have gotten away with a great deal more. Lola's eyes would be glued to the television hardcore. Her ears, presumably, were heeding the sonorous tones of the announcer while simultaneously engaged in spirited dialogue with God. As far as I could tell, their conversations were conducted in a polyglot admixture of English, Ibana, a smattering of her fault in Tagalog, and robust Spanish cursing, Diablo, Diablo, Diablo! <laughs> Lola would cry out suddenly, startling me, and for years I remained convinced that this Spanish word for devil literally meant, Look, Lord, the ball has been stolen! <laughs> Since that was generally what was occurring on screen at these times. <laughs> Lana maintained that her intermediary intercession was invariably efficacious, despite the fact that the Redmanizer seemed to lose nearly as often as they won. <laughs> she explained this to me once, after I had applied my brilliant strategy of standing on two phone books, both yellow and white pages, to replace the incriminating can of Klim on its just out of reach shelf. They win because of the power of prayer, Lana said. She had, been a, she had once been a Spanish teacher at a convent school and retained a certain style of teaching. But sometimes they lose because they are stupid. <laughs> if they're so stupid, I asked in my most smart alecky manner, then how come Crispa is still your favorite? Lola looked down at me as if my preteen IQ had precipitously plummeted down to the colonized Redmanizer levels. They are my team, she said. <laughs> Thank you. That was sneaky up our story read by Rio. Um, so um, Marilyn Altusola was there with us next. And Marilyn was born in San Francisco, California, to Vincio Altisola and Sofia uh, Caballero uh, Altisola, both from the Cebu. Um, the child of Latinx immigrants, she was the only one of her generation uh, of many cousins to be born in the United States. She identifies as a second generation Filipinx American because her, her parents, naturalized US citizens, had contributed a great deal to the welfare of the country and very much deserved to be called first generation Americans. Her lifelong interest in literature was instilled in her by her father, Provencio, who wrote poetry. Marilyn has taught Asian American literature at several universities and has published articles on Carlos Bulusan, Asian American Literature, Asian American Studies. Uh, currently, she has broadened her scope to the areas of multimedia arts, such as painting, sculpting, assemblage, video, and creative writing. Here's Marilyn. Um, this short story is entitled, It's Cold in America. It's set in the 1950s in foggy San Francisco. The material content of the historian. Oh, not closer. Yeah. Oh, okay. The material context of the story was one of what I call making do. In the wake of the Vasper Society, the community was far from ideal in terms of material comfort and luxuries. Two of the main characters were a mismatched couple. Benny Abadia was a non materialistic, idealistic dreamer. Uh, his wife, Sylvia Delgado Abadia was a materialistic, practical pragmatist. The story that follows deals with improvised communities and their mismatched friends. This couple, the Abadias, had one child, an only child um, they called Aurelia, and <clears throat> nicknamed her Ori for short. She was an only child in an adult world. She would often spy on the adults. We can call her the lurker. <laughs> Characteristically, Sylvia Delgado had what her relatives back home called high hat thoughts. Her cousins and nieces said she always thought after society. Her current society, however, was waiting for her in the kitchen that evening. It was not the society of her earlier dreams. The members of this social group did not bring prestige, such as that was. Instead, they brought laughter, gossip, good times, loose change, 
and crumpled dollar bills at stake at the Abadia's house in a card game of winning and losing. They had a variety of um, friends that were <clears throat> very different from each other. Up on the camera. Yeah. One couple who often visited the Abadias were the Romeros. Both were from the Philippines. Their only congruent characteristic. Their stark similarities were much more glaring. They were quite the odd pair. Nellie Romero was much That's older than her husband. She looked like his mother rather than like his wife. <laughs> Ori had been instructed to call her Auntie Melly, although she was not her real aunt. Melly was very small in stature with graying hair and a rounded body. Ari always thought of her as a Mrs. Potato Head, although it was her body and not her head that resembled a potato. But this Mrs. Potato Head smoked cigarettes, just like women in movies and television. Ari's proper mother never smoked. The strangest thing about Auntie Melly, Ari observed, was her custom of rolling down her nylon stockings below the knee. She must have used rubber bands to hold them up. Why she made this strange and unglamorous fashion choice was a mystery to Ari, who never who knew better with, a, with her fashion sense that she gleaned from watching television on the small black and white screen. Auntie Melly wore red lipstick and makeup like the women in Technicolor movies, but smoking and red lipstick was where Auntie Melly's attempt at glamour began and ended. <laughs> Auntie Melly's husband, the <clears throat> fictive Uncle Loy, was significantly younger than her and appeared to be at least a foot and a half taller. He had oily, jet black, curly hair. He was outgoing and loquacious and described as handsome by some, although Ori did not agree. For one thing, he smoked smelly cigars that Ori could not stand. And he would stick a toothpick in the soggy end of the cigar that went into his mouth so he would not have to stress his lips. He also saved his partially smoked cigars for later use. This was simply disgusting for the child. The word her mother used to describe Roy was polykettle, a playboy with a soggy, wet cigar. Being so tall and talking down to the child, he sometimes annoyed Ari. In spite of this, she had to be polite to him for her mother's mandate. She did not want to incur any more nagging lectures, and she had to. No one seemed to know the genesis of this odd pairing of Melly and Loy. If they did, Ari never heard it. Was Uncle Boy looking for a mother? Or was it a bonding of real love in spite of generational divide and discrepancies in personal attractiveness? Also, there was the issue that she, not he, was the older of the two, thus changing the configuration of a typical maybe suburb coupling. Or maybe it was a union of a practical matter, a way for him to stay in the United States, a land of the Yankee dollar. Not even Ari the Lurker knew, nor then and not later. Like many children, she took things at face value, had not yet reached the adolescent age of prejud prejudicial judgment. Aunt Melly and Uncle Lloyd seemed to get along. Never arguing or contradicting each other, much like her parents did. Mr. and Mrs. Romero were a married couple, and to Ari, that was that. Even if much of the time Ori was a sole child among adults, there were other children spread throughout the city in a community unbound by borders. A younger male child grew up um, with a single divorced mother from Japan and a father from the Philippines was sometimes cared for by her mother at their home. The boy's name was Justin. On one ominous day, at Auntie Melly's house, three women present were partaking in a discussion of serious nature. This was not a social get together, that was clear. There was no food or drink and no gambling. But in spite of the gravity of the subject, two of the women were their usual viva and tackling selves. Justin and Ori were the only children present. 
Auntie Melly, of course, was present in her own home. So was another woman, ostensibly a friend of Auntie Melly, unknown to the children. The third participant was Ari's mother, Sylvia, who had the younger boy at her charge that day. Auntie Melly was sobbing profusely. She was the only person who was not diva, not cackling. Although Melly was not normally an effusive woman, this behavior was quite unusual. With her open palm, Auntie Melly was, sitting, hit, was hitting her bare knee directly above her strangely rolled down nylon stocking. Between sobs, she repeated the words, quote, I don't know why he's doing this to me. I love him. I need him. I love him. I need him. Unquote. Her voice became louder and louder as she accentuated her words with rhythmic thumps, rhythmic thumps on the knee above her rolled down stocking. Ori, wide-eyed with wonder, could focus only on the rolled down stocking with its lumpy ring at the top around her leg. This time, the usually invisible worker voluntarily stood in front of the adult, squarely in full view. Being inquisitive, she was deeply interested in the drama unfolding. She did not have to hide under a table or behind a door to spy on these histrionic adults. Surprisingly, she was invisible to them without her even trying. That was because they were focused on poor little Justin, so they did not notice her at all. There was some big mystery afoot, and Justin became the object of interrogation. At first, they treated him like a key witness to a major crime. That lasted but a moment. The tension escalated as they began to interrogate him as if he were actually a suspect, not just a witness. It was like a scene out of Dragnet. Dum, da -dum, dum. The two women attending Auntie Melly seemed to be enjoying themselves, but poor Justin was not having a good time at all. He was truly put upon. Quote, Justin, did you see Uncle Roy and Auntie Petita kissing? The unidentified woman asked. Roy, remember, was Melly's baby husband, the only man with a wet cigar, and Adita was her best friend's mother. Who would want to kiss him, Ari thought. The pathetic boy was bewildered. Why in the world would they be kissing each other? They did not. That did not sound right to the boy. After all, Auntie Adita and Uncle Lloyd weren't the ones that were married to each other. They were both married, but to other people. The question was confusing to Justin, but the two women pressed on. They were almost twice the height of the boy, standing so close to him that he could feel their body heat. He was sweating and maybe even shuddering a bit. They were looking down upon him, and he, neck craning, was looking up at them, eyes and mouth stretched wide open. He could not run. At first, he felt like he was glued to the ground. In the moments to follow, he then began to feel that he had left the ground, floating upwards as the two women grilled him, flipping him over and over like a hamburger until he was done. Finally, out of the mouth of a terrified child, the probing women got the information they were lusting after. When Justin told them that the duo in question, Uncle Roy and Auntie Edita, quote, went into the bedroom and closed the door, unquote, he knowingly, <clears throat> boom. From the women came a chorus of gasps, sobs, and cackles. Two cackles, one sob, and all three gasped. Poor Justin, Ari thought. He really should learn to stay out of sight or to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> Ari and Justin did not speak of the incident afterwards. There was a difference in their age, and neither had the life experience to edify each other on the matter. The Romeros stayed together, and no more was heard of Roy's transgression. Perhaps it was easier for the Romeros to stay together. Divorce was not as typical in those days, especially in a Catholic community. And who would, who could afford to bother with a lawyer anyway? Also, there was a symmetry in that odd pairing, and it suited their needs for the time it lasted. Eventually, circumstances for Justin and his working single mother changed when they both disappeared from the scene. Ari did not miss Justin, having always considered the younger child as an interloper anyway. 
In spite of the interlacing of lives, the cohesion of the group was not to last over the years. It was a movable, changeable community. Many people did not stay in the same house or the same neighborhood, unlike those who dwell in permanent forever homes. Those that could afford to moved up. Others even acquired new families and circumstances. Others merely moved on. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, there is one author and story in this book, and I have not been able, she was supposed to show up in a book launch in the Philippines, but she was unable to. But I'm going to share an excerpt. It's very interesting. It has to do with the extrajudicial uh, killings, of, of not, not directly, but it involves uh, that, what uh, that was happening during uh, the Duterte years, of course. Um, and I was just hoping Kanika would share her work one day, and she never has, so I'll share it for her. Um, so the author is Kanika Claudine Pena, and she is a freelance writer from Bataan. She graduated with a degree in creative writing from the University of the Philippines, Biliman, um, and her short stories have appeared in Growing Up Filipino Too. She was in the second volume, and she is currently preparing her debut novel for publication. And I just read a, a section of it. Um, her title is, Let Me Tell You About My Aunt Edelweiss. And I'm picking it up, not from the beginning, but inside. And that's when Aunt M, Edelweiss, showed up. It was the first time I'd ever seen her. And she looked like nothing like I imagined. I was imagining a wild genius, kind of like a young and female Einstein with the hair and the irreverent stare. Instead, what I saw was a kind of chubby nerd with a permanent sneer, bad hair tied neatly in a heavy ponytail, and tattoos around her wrist. They were letters. She showed them to me when she saw me looking. They were quotations from books I'd never heard of. On the left, quote, for ultimately and precisely in the deepest and most important matters, we are unspeakably alone. Rainer Marie Relfield. And on the right, did you ever notice that animals never kill themselves, even when they're sure to lose? Orphan Wilder. I asked her what they meant, but she simply rough, ruffled my hair and smiled. They're not that deep. You'll figure them out someday. <laughs> then she wrote them on a piece of paper for me. The piece of paper she tore off this tiny spring notebook that she fished out from her loose jeans pocket. I learned that she always carried one. I always forget things. So this is how I keep track. I found it so cool. I took to carrying one myself. What do you need that tiny notebook for? My mother asked when we were doing our back to school shopping. Are you thinking wedding numbers for Ati Anim? She laughed at her own unfunny joke. Wedding is illegal, I said. You should stop, I added. She rolled her eyes and nodded. Don't tell your father. Anyway, that one single encounter formed my entire picture of Aunt Anne, and still, I understood nothing about her. She sounded nothing like the wayward rebel her siblings described her to be. She was quiet most of the time, just looking and listening and observing. She only spoke when spoken to. That one conversation, if you could even call that a conversation, was the only unprompted one I'd seen her make the entire day. She came late then left early. Just as she did in her family, Aunt Julie noted, she said she had to leave before 4 p.m. to catch the bus. No one dared to ask where to where and when she left. Her siblings all looked at one another 
accepting that at least one of them had thought to ask beforehand. And it continues. And it's really quite touching. Um, I'm just going to, it's a kind of a spoiler, but in the end, this wild Aunt M who comes and goes, comes back and asks the father of this girl for some money um, and is to bury somebody. And it, it her, her boyfriend had been uh, a uh, subject of uh, extrajudicial. So, but it's it's a lovely story, and if you have the opportunity to read it. So, um, I thought that for fun, we would call on some people to share their own uh, just informal, personal uh, memories made that have to do with growing up as well. And um, so, I'm I'm going to call on me. Yes, uh, uh, Herminia Manias. I took it first. Sure. Yes, I took it first because I'm the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Min, can you give a brief bio of yourself just for those who don't well, know? Well, this be in my little story. Okay. All right. If I were to. It's on. It's on. It's on. What is it? I, I but it's mainly for the people on Zoom. Hmm? It's, it's mainly for people on Zoom. For the recording. Yeah, it's it's working. Oh. People on Zoom is not. Oh, is this okay? No. 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 Just close to you. Sir. Yeah, that's it. Dear, this is my first time. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I were to collect the memory from my childhood, it would have to be from the days of the Japanese invasion. The Second World War. The Second World War was the nightmare of my childhood. And sometimes it still is. In this recurring dream or nightmare, if you will, I am a five year old girl in a large two story house with lots and lots of windows and doors. It's almost nighttime. And I hear these strange sounds from outside. The main door is being knocked and rapped by hard knocks. And I hear the sounds of men speaking in a language I don't understand. These men are trying to get inside the house. Knock, knock every door and window. So I run, run all over. Living room, closing all the doors and windows, and I, I hear this man again. I got no sounds. I hear voices. I don't speak in a language that I said that I don't understand. What are they? What are they? And so I run all over the living room, knocking all the windows, knocking all the knocking all the doors, and then I go to the bedroom. There are somehow there are lots and lots of bedrooms. And I have to close every window and every door with this mechanism because it was not, yeah, sorry, um, you know, just automatic. So I didn't go up the seven feet to start the floor. Time was running out. This man, you know, sitting in the front door. So from the bedrooms, finally I get to the kitchen. And then again, somehow the kitchen has many windows and many doors. So again, I do the same thing, knocking up, knocking up, knocking up. And finally, I open the trap door, the kitchen floor, and I descend into this darkness in the basement. And I don't get to see anything, but I feel my way around an air raid shelter. Now, in reality, this a raid shelter was prepared by my father a few months before the Japanese invasion. Somehow he knew that the Japanese were going to invade the Philippines and that Japan was going to enter the war at the time when the war was raging in Europe. Now, the a raid shelter was not quite finished. It was like three feet deep. But there I was crouching there, and this is in real life now, with my parents and my younger brother. 
everybody here, and people screaming on the streets. They were running up and down the streets, screaming, screaming, you know. The bombs are falling, bombs are falling, bombs are falling. And the following day, I learned that in my grandmother's backyard, across our house, a bomb had fallen. Nobody got killed, but the young Chinese girl was hit in the leg with a shrapnel. She survived, but the scar was there. I saw it when she was, when, you know, later on. <clears throat> there were more scary stories about the war, more of the scary memories of the war. But this one incident was so intense in my mind that it became a recurring dream. And even now, sometimes maybe I'm, you know, you know, under a lot of stress, I have this dream that I'm still a child, five-year-old child. On that day, December 8th, 1941, when the bombs fell in our little town of Kalibo, Aklan, which was then Kalibo, Thank you. <laughs> that was Dr. Dr. Herminia Menez. Um, and Ming is uh, actually a folklorist, and uh, he has a PhD, has written quite a number of books specifically in folklore, uh, professor. Um, so thank you, Ming, for sharing. And I, I thought I'd also call on Raciel to, to share. If you could just give a little intro about okay. yourself, Raciel. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so uh, my name is Raciel. Shepherd and my maiden name is Wagata. So my I family still. is from the northern part of the Philippines. Uh, and um, when I was little, I wanted to be a writer. And my mom said, well, how are you going to feed your family? <laughs> so I became a scientist. Uh, so 30 years later, after my kids are grown, I said, you know, I still want to be a writer. And I had this uh, grand scheme that I was going to write the great American novel, and I'm going to call it Growing Up Filipino. Mm -hmm. And I looked, and I said, oh, it's taken. So, <laughs> so uh, I've been working again with the pandemic. Um, we had more time on our hands, and I finally wrote uh, my first draft, and it's a work in progress, and it's called Born There, uh, Growing Up Ilocano and Migrating uh, to the Land of Milk and Honey. And since uh, we want to limit this, I just took a little snippet of uh, me and my grandmother in Ilocos. Um, this is the story of the first and last time I lied to my grandmother. I spent my childhood summers in Ilocos and I complained every time we traveled there. I much prefer the mountains, cool air and pine trees of Baguio City where I grew up. In Ilocos, the road was flat as far as I could see, and the heat permeated every pore of my body. I broke out in rashes from head to toe. When that happened, Lola shook Johnson's baby powder on me to relieve the itchings. I looked like the rice cake shaped like a tongue and coated with sugar and coconut flakes. <laughs> One evening, my brother and I came back from the fields where we played all day. Lola greeted us at the gate, her arms on her hips. We followed her into the house. I noticed that the table was clean, but it was surely dinner time. Did you not hear the church bells? She asked. No, Lola, I declared with a straight face. <laughs> My brother glared at me. The bells could be heard all the way to the next town. I even knew when they rang because my cousin was the bell ringer and he disappeared on the hour from our play. I knew lying was a sin, even at eight years old, but I did not realize that missing dinner was a mortal sin. <laughs> Lola sent us upstairs, but somehow my brother snuck in a piece of pandesal and he tied, his, uh, tied it us through the night. The next morning, Lola dragged me out of bed. It was still dark and I struggled not to stumble down the street steep staircase. She led me through the double wooden doors and onto the veranda. Listen, she commanded. The rooster crowed and it startled me awake. She pointed, Jaydaya, 
to the east. Like magic, the sun burst through the dark sky in streaks of yellow and orange. It is six o'clock in the morning, she stated. Around midday, she asked me to stand in the middle of the yard. I did not dare complain about the heat. Do you see your shadow? She asked. I shook my head and she nodded. It is 12 noon. In the evening, Lola motioned me to follow her to the plaza, de Lao, west of our hometown. It was my favorite moment of the day when the heat broke. We sat on the bench under the massive acacia trees, watched the leaves. While looking up, I again heard the rooster crow. The sun went down and the church bells tolled. I counted six times. In the dimming light, I saw the acacia leaves fold together two by two as if in prayer. Lola made the sign of the cross and I copied her. Together, we recited the angelus and walked home. I never missed dinner again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. She also was, I did not prepare you, but if you want to well, share some, some, some memory or something yeah. from your youth. Mm. Your youth. Well, uh, okay. Mm. Um, this is, uh, I grew up in Baguio too. Mm. And so uh, it, this was a very uh, um, novel experience for me. It was Christmas time. And so from the distance, it was evening. And from the distance, I could hear the thumping of uh, the, I guess it was a gong, you know. Mm -hmm. So they were fast approaching. and. Um, they came onto our small porch. There were three uh, oh, indigenous, three indigenous uh, uh, um, people. I guess they're called uh, Ifugals, the Ifugal tribe. And they were dressed in uh, G-strings and a coat. It was kind of cold, but that was their natural garb. And so they were rhythmically dancing around the porch and they're you know boom 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 so that was very atypical caroling you know mm -hmm. Christmas time people would come and and, and uh, carol and sing songs but this was different so they they decided I guess why not use Christmas time <laughs> to oh, display oh, our <laughs> dance and um it, it was very memorable. And my mom, who uh, usually didn't, you know, display too much at, at that period of her life, she broke into a dance, you know, the native <laughs> dance. And and uh, that was very heartwarming. Um, she came from Ilocos, the Ilocos uh, region, but her father was... Uh, uh, named uh, appointed governor treasurer of the mountain provinces. So they live in Bangkok, which is the capital of the mountain province. And that's where she learned that mm -hmm. with the native dance. Oh, how nice. Thank you very much. So that was uh, Jocelyn mm -hmm. uh, Deyaga Rosenthal. Thank you so much. I, I will call on Rio to tell uh, anything. Think of some memory of their folks. Yeah, um, when I was a kid, uh, I grew up in Pasi, and uh, I had an ate and a bayaya, like a nanny time, uh, who lived in the house with us. And there was this time when I was little when I had a terrible fever. And we went to the doctor, and the doctor was just like, it's a fever, it'll pass, maybe take this medicine. But nothing was really working. I wasn't getting better. I felt awful. My parents didn't know what to do. Uh, but our ate knew what to do, apparently. She kind of only realized after a couple of doctor trips that something was wrong. She's like, oh, the kid's still sick. We all still sick. What's happening? And we were like, well, you know, my parents were saying, he's sick and he's not getting any better and we don't know what to do. And she was like, well, all this time, I did not disclose this to you when you hired me, but I am a mangpula. <laughs> 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 Uh, and so she kind of 
assessed me, I guess. I don't remember it very clearly, but she explained that I had lamig in my stomach. Mm -hmm. Was the main problem. And naturally, the doctor missed this. <laughs> and she was that kind of modern Mabukulam that's a combination of you know traditional practices, but also Catholicism. Mm -hmm. So she was she had her rosary and she started chanting something. I believe she was she was Igongo. So I didn't understand the words myself, but it was a combination of that and uh, prayer. And she took a uh, saliva and mm. she began massaging it across my stomach. And I'm sitting there the whole time. I'm maybe eight, and I'm thinking, I don't understand what's happening. <laughs> and I feel sick and bad. But the next morning, immediately, fever broke. Yeah. And we never doubted her again. Thank you. Thank you. So, is there any questions now? We can, you know, we'll, we'll do a Q and A. Um, so there's some. Whatever you uh, have any questions. Mm -hmm. no. oh. mm. Wait, get the mic. Uh, so I have I have a question, uh, and it's more on the the business side of the literary artist world. Um, so you know the the demand probably for our stories is probably not as as high as right. more <laughs> mainstream you know genres Absolutely. uh so how do we you know balance the need for telling your stories but also as artists who you know need to yeah. pay the bills <laughs> also um to to balance that that yes. um economics you know, it's it's hard. I mean, uh, uh, I'll pass it around to whoever knows. But it's hard for all writers, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, for all writers and artists, they really generally do not make money. There's just a small percent that do. Um, and yes, that is our problem here because we are um, <laughs> our stories are not uh, what generally make. They're not mainstream. You know, it's not easy to send our stories over to, uh, you know, Seventeen magazine or whatever magazine and get them published because the market there is for, uh, you know, a white uh, Anglo-Saxon kind of, you know, population. So it is a problem. I have to say that there are more Filipino writers now, Filipino-American writers have been published than in the 1970s. Um, so there are more, so maybe this, maybe there are more Filipinos buying. And the, the other hitch to that is that Filipino Americans are not really fond of buying books or reading mm -hmm. books, you know? So that's another issue because it is a business. I mean, a publisher does not print these books just for fun. Ultimately it's to sell and the bookstores sell them to sell <laughs> not because they look pretty. And so we run into problems when we do not support our own writers. And it, it really is true. I mean, I just read, I won't mention it, you know, uh, my Twitter feelings, but it was a very, it was a bestseller nine years ago, super, super bestseller. I mean, it was, they had a, a Spanish translation, they had a blah, 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 you know, all over. And, and it was remaindered, that the book was remaindered anyway. Remaindered means, it's dead, it was killed. Um, they didn't sell enough, still, you mm -hmm. know, when you, you get to a certain level, it needs to sell. I feel really fortunate that um, the Uni University of Santo Tomas has picked this up. And actually the first book was also picked up by Anvil because there is actually a Filipino market. And when we were there and we were launching it, they were just crazy about it. They just totally embrace this book. It's amazing to me. You know, they loved it. I did four uh, book events there and they were just buying the books and just really very, very enthusiastic. They're asking me, are you going to do growing up Filipino four? <laughs> they want it to be like a serial. Um, it is, you know, because there are of course so many Filipinos, you know, so they can buy it. And um, so, but, 
the, the flip side to that is that there are not very many of them, and if they are there and they are good, then maybe libraries and so on will look for them. But I don't know if anybody else has opinions about the business side of writing. Um, you're very welcome to. I'll comment. Uh, if not now, then later. <laughs> if it doesn't, if it does, if it's not a big seller. I, I guess the, the saving grace for it, it's great that it's written down and documented. And maybe the subsequent generations will maybe a hit. So, and maybe a, a money, make, money maker then. Anyway, just a, just a thought. And if I could add to that also, and sometimes it may not be a money maker, but I think it's important for us to document our yes. own stories. Yeah, Absolutely important because how can our children and our grandchildren just grow up reading of protagonists that do not look like them or do not have their culture it's it's not it's not right you know so we try to, we try to do our best and we know it's not really a money maker but there's all in most cases i think people who get into this uh feel it's almost like a job to do it, you know, to to do something, to document our stories, to share with the next generation. Um, so you, you can see that, <laughs> yeah, the realities of it is, you know, so it helps if you have funding, if there were funding. And if, I, if my business, Philippine American uh, Literary House, had time, if I had time, then I could run around looking for funding and this guy, but then you run into the bureaucracy of it, you know, bureaucracy you to file forms and all of this, you know, all of this stuff. And uh, that's not my cup of tea. So I kind of, if there's money, I'll do this. And then, you know, and then it just sort of, you know, makes enough to kind of carry it over that, that sort of thing. Um, but for the mainstream publishers, that's not enough. They need, and this is why then they remainder the works of our Filipino Filipino writer and American writers because they need to sell. So that's so they only do one printing. Then um, never again. If ever well, at all. Yeah. If ever at all. It 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 depends on um so I mean my own first novel was published by a big house. It was published by Dutton Penguin. And so they did a uh, uh, first run and they give you an advance on all of this. And then frankly, because they had changes and so on, uh, there was a, the, the publishing houses were buying one another out, they remaindered it. But I am not unique. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows Frankie Jose, uh, you know, the famous Frankie Jose passed away last year. He used to have famous talks about, he would laugh and he'd go, Cecilia, so they invited me, the publisher in New York invited me and we sat around and they looked at me and they said, so how many, what should our first print run be? A million? <laughs> and he said, he thinks they did 30,000 and it wasn't all sold, you know, so, and that, this is Frankie Jose, who was about as, you know, famous as a Filipino novelist can get. So, well, he passed away last year, but I mean, he, he's the national artist that is but a name for decades. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, I mentioned to you, I will not mention her name, but I mean, this was a really hot bestseller commercial kind of book and still, but that's the nature of it because I have been with other writers too, or not just Filipinos. And yes, you have they have a bestseller, and then and then it's remindered, and then maybe they'll have a second bestseller, and then and then they just sort of peter out, you know. And some of them don't even then start writing anymore because I don't know. I guess they didn't get this Yeah, it's hard to put in all that time and energy. You know, it's a big risk. Um, yeah, except some some people really are called <laughs> to do it. It's almost like a calling. Yeah, some will feel it anyway, even if it's not making I'd like to share, this is more as, as a filmmaker um, from the African-American community, you know, because they were, I guess at one point, um, still kind of uh, a big risk for mainstream to pick up. Yeah. But uh, Ava DuVernay, I'm not sure if you guys know her, but she made Selma and now she's made all these big films. 
they started is a you know I was part of Film Independent and and she shared her story and how they did it. She was in a marketing uh, position, but they formed a collective to kind of like come together to promote their stories. Um, and then because Hollywood was not going to pick it up, you yeah. know, it's just a big risk uh, for African American stories. Um, and there was just a point where you know um, there was a turning point because they built their they they came together to build that leverage. Yeah. And I've always imagined that we can do the same thing for Filipino uh, American stories for our community is and and that I think that's what we're doing and that's why I'm here as part of the Friends and the uh, Carlos Wilson Book Club is that we need that leverage you know because um, we can't come together that's our strength right we think in collectives so if we could perfect that and and combine it with um, like the need for different you know artists and entrepreneurs we can you know we're, there's a lot of filipino americans about what four million plus now mm -hmm. wow. so that's a lot that's that's there's a million copies there there <laughs> yeah so we can come to that point but like what the african-american community did they had to do it first and then from there, once they had leverage, then they broke through. And then now it's not a risky proposition anymore to make African-American films. Black Panther is, you know, an example of that. So, yeah. There, it's only think, took 400 years. <laughs> <laughs> in some level, educating people is also important, you know, because um, I, I knew Filipinos here who would not buy a book here because it was too expensive and they would wait like two years before they get to the Philippines and they can buy it cheap. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, hello. Um, yeah, I know we want to save money, but you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a group that's very supportive, the Japanese Americans. Yeah. Oh my God. I was with my friend Naomi Hirahara, who is a mystery writer, and she writes commercial. You know, she's really good and she's very talented. But I went with her into a, a, a Japanese American uh, uh, something. Oh my God, they all turned out, these little old ladies, mm -hmm. and they bought stacks of books. And some of them didn't really speak English very well. So I think they were just going to give them away or something. They, they were there to just support Naomi. Mm -hmm. And I remember Naomi and I were talking once and she said, you know, Cecilia, it's because I think she she called, she pointed out a couple states that really bought her books. And that was um, the states heavy with Japanese Americans. And that put her in the bestseller list. Those two states that really bought her books. And I remember her telling me that I'm like, ah. because um, that's how she got the bestseller, because the community just, they were there, they buy stacks of books. Yeah. I was just amazed. The same book, you know, like about five or 10 and little tiny babies were going up to the cash register. It was amazing. Um, so there you are. I mean, I don't know if the Filipinos will get there. <laughs> that honestly reminds me of I've seen people do similar things while in the Philippines. Like, yeah. My they, parents they, were always dragging me around to book launches, and people will come and buy do. big stacks yeah. just to support that each other. True. When I had my first book launch, I was like 17 or 15 or something. People would come that I think were like friends of a friend of a family friend. Mm -hmm. Come and buy twelve copies of the book and have me sign all twelve. Yeah. And then I I came to America like last year, and where is everybody? Yeah. <laughs> where is everybody? Yeah. And we were in a book launching in fully book in Manila. It was like this real, where people were there. It was it was a smallish place, but it was packed. And they were buying, they were buying stacks mm -hmm. because you could see them, they're going from author to author and they got these stacks. So mm -hmm. the same title. So yeah, so they were they were kind of doing that there. Yeah. Um, so maybe one day <laughs> we will kind of get there. Um the, I think one of the problems here too is the distance. Yeah, you know, so we're very small. Communities are a lot more spread out, right? 
Now in San Francisco, they have a you know, fairly cohesive group, but then it's a kind of confined space. LA is difficult or scattered. I think New York is pretty good too for, for pulling people together. But um, so Zoom helps and, and so on. But yeah, we're here. Let's <laughs> under the launch, let me know. Um, you should tell us about your book. <laughs> oh, uh, the one I was just talking about, it was ages ago. Uh, my dad and I, Dean Alfar, we collaborated on a short story collection uh, called Stars and Jars, Strange and Fantastic Stories. Uh, we wanted to do uh, stories for young adults. So we each contributed four stories. We each did two fantasy and two sci-fi stories, and then we mixed them all together in the book. And uh, it was really fun and really confusing and scary. And it was like, I'd done, I'd published individual short stories previously, but this was my first time like putting out a collection and my name's on the cover and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was a big deal then. Here, we have a young film writer. <laughs> <laughs> Following on you now. Yeah, great question. <laughs> Is there any other questions or concerns? Yeah. So um, I want to thank all of you for um, coming uh, here today. Uh, and for um, Marilyn, I was waiting for you to talk about the shiny red table. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. That's, I, um, I really love that in your story about how that became uh, the, the lurker's um, Paradise, her yeah. her vantage point uh, yeah. for watching the adults. Uh, Thank you. I really enjoyed that, and we, your your reading was just amazing. Uh, are you in theater at all? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So um, I do want to thank. Uh, I I'm telling everyone it's my first time to meet Cecilia, and I've been lurking and stalking her on Facebook and Instagram, <laughs> and just being uh, looking at everything, and I'm just amazed how um like you have done so much for the community and for lectures too like um I, I for me when I see the word Cebu I said oh there's one person who is like almost synonymous with Cebu and you've made Ubek and I followed all your um your stories uh, so I, I really just want to thank you uh for giving me the inspiration um when I first discovered Growing Up Filipino, apparently that's not going to be my title now. <laughs> um, so I read it. Yeah, I feel yeah. kind of. Yeah. Um, so one and two, uh, there are some stories that are written by the, the same people, but different stories. Uh, and I've discovered people like, say, Veronica Montes, and she wrote this story that every single time I read it, I just it's like the first time, and I laugh allowed it's the story about her um grandfather uh who has a wife yeah. and everyone mistook her for the maid mm -hmm. uh and it was this the funniest yeah. funniest story mm -hmm. uh and so every time i look at one of these books it's almost like uh a friend uh, i'm like oh what is she up to now and it's <laughs> just different collection <laughs> like uh, so for this one, there's another story. That's great. And it's Thank almost you. like, because I grew up, obviously, you can tell that I grew up with books. <laughs> um, it's um, like you see your old friend. Thank That's you. nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll yeah. tell Veronica. Yeah. <laughs> she will like that. Thank you. <laughs> so are we uh, good? Any other lingering questions desire to <laughs> to or don't have any thank you uh, <clears throat> well thank you cecilia thank you. not only is she a good writer she's a great painter oh, no. <laughs> if you follow her friend yeah, her Marilyn's a good painter. She's a cook. She's a. Oh, no. But anyway, she, she, she is a person of multi, multi talents. <laughs> Some people call it manic. <laughs> oh, I forgot to mention, I did bring some books that are heavily discounted. Um, so if you are interested, my husband is my fan. <laughs> thank you so much, TBC. Um, you know, and the thank you, my name. Well, 
uh, we hope to see you next year <laughs> or whenever. But <laughs> so again, I'd like to uh, thank for everybody coming here. Uh, this is where I think on our fourth year of doing book launches or CC CBBC plan uh, programming. Uh, visit visit our website at cbbc.club and uh till we meet again have a nice afternoon